Thank you, Luis. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to lecture at a site that uh, an establishment that Wolfgang Pauli was uh, uh, instrumental in founding and was very happy when it was founded. And uh, when the site was finally established in 1952, he expressed his admiration in a, in a typically Pauli way. He wrote to the physicist Otto Stern saying that, well, this is not so, this place is not so stupid after all, it'll mean jobs for theoretical physicists. And, and indeed, Pauli presented many interesting lectures to the theory group. And today I'm going to talk about uh, what happened when the, the, the brilliant but troubled scientist Wolfgang Pauli met the great psychologist Carl Jung in 1932. The question is, can Jung's analysis of Pauli's dreams shed any light on how Pauli made his scientific discoveries? Let me begin by setting the stage with uh, uh, with the standard science history version of how Pauli discovered the exclusion principle. Now, in 1913, Niels Bohr uh, suggested a theory of the atom based on the iconic image of the atom as a minuscule solar system. Uh, the electrons were like planets circling the central nucleus or sun, and uh, in, in Bohr's theory, the electrons were restricted to only, to only certain orbits, which are labeled with the principal quantum number, a whole number, n equals one, two, three, and so on. And when an electron drops from a higher to a lower orbit, the atom emits light, which is registered in the laboratory as a spectral line. Now, despite the magnificent successes of Bohr's theory, uh, some uh, deep problems remain in it. First of all, why didn't every electron fall into the atom's lowest orbit? Well, 1922, Bohr offered to, uh, a guess at the correct distribution of electrons in the allowed orbits, but he offered no details. And it goes like this. In the innermost orbit or shell, labeled with K, there are two electrons and eight, 18, 32. In other words, it's a series in two times n squared, where n is the principal quantum number. The other issue was when an atom is placed between the pole faces of a magnet, certain spectral lines split into several called multiplets. Uh, many sets of multiplets uh, defied any explanation with Bohr's theory. This was called the anomalous Zeeman effect. Physicists uh, obsessed over it, including uh, the 22-year-old Wunderkin Wolfgang Pauli, who finally became so disgusted that he gave, he just set the problem aside, and but kept up with the burgeoning literature. In 1924, while on the faculty at the University of Hamburg, Pauli had two brain waves. The first was what did relativity theory have to say about the predominant model of an atom with one free electron, the alkali atoms? Now, physicists uh, uh, studied alkali atoms uh, with some intensity because it, it mimicked the hydrogen atom, which was the only atom that the Bohr theory any, uh, ever had any real success with in a quantitative way. Uh, the alkali atom uh, in, in the models that were considered at the time, there was a closed inert core of filled shells of electrons, and then the entire chemical activity of the atom fell on the shoulders of the free electron. Uh, in order to explain the anomalous Zeeman effect, Bohr proposed that the inert core was, uh, dis could be distorted in two ways by a vaguely defined force, and the factor of two, or one-half to be more precise, was indigenous to all uh, closed core models. Uh, but Pauli found that electrons in the closed core can move at speeds close to that of light. This should affect the spacing between the multiplets. Disagreed with laboratory data in his typical, in his uh, inimical way, uh, Pauli declared that uh, core models were useless. The second brain wave requires a, just a word of background. Uh, the state or condition or position of, uh, of an electron on a Bohr atom depended on three whole numbers called quantum numbers. That was reasonable that it should depend upon three numbers because after all, the electron moved in, th in three-dimensional space. Enter Edwin F. Stoner, who was a physicist at the University of Leeds, and by a joint manipulation of, uh, of the uh, three quantum numbers, Stoner found a way to associate the number of multiplets in an, in, an, in an alkali atom undergoing the anomalous Zeeman effect with how the electron shells fill up. And that was, as, that was as far as he went. Enter Pauli. Pauli realized how to extend Stoner's result 
beyond the, the anomalous Zeeman effect by allocating to each electron the two-valuedness of the useless core. He did it as follows. He assigned to each electron in the atom a fourth quantum number with a value one-half, which was soon to be associated with the spin of the electron. Ex ergo, the exclusion principle followed. As you know, no two electrons in an atom can have the same four quantum numbers. This tells you how the shells, how the electron shells, the electronic shells fill up the way they do, so substantiated Bohr's guess, and also enabled scientists to un begin to understand the periodic table of elements, and it had cosmic consequences. It told you not only why metals are hard, but why certain stars die as they do, for example, white dwarfs. So that, in a nutshell, is, the, is, uh, is an outline of the, of, the science, of, of the science of Pauli's discovery of the exclusion principle. But one would like to know more. One would like to know how he discovered it, what was Pauli's mindset at the time, and in particular, why did Pauli angst over going from three to four quantum numbers? Now, although Pauli uh, was a great compartmentalizer, could it have been at that at the moment when he made his creative breakthrough in December 1924 that the watertight compartments in his mind broke down? Now, Pauli, there are two sides to Pauli's personality, it turned out. By day, he was a, he was a, uh, uh, a straight arrow, uh, Germanic Austrian uh, hair professor doctor. By night, it was another story, as he revealed to Jung some years later. The specific threat to my life has been the fact that in the first half of my life, I swing from one extreme to the other. In the first half of my life, I was a cold and cynical devil to other people, and a fanatical atheist, an intellectual intriguer. The opposition to that was, on the one hand, a tendency towards being a criminal, a thug, which could have degenerated into me becoming a murderer, and on the other hand, being detached from the world, a totally unintellectual hermit with outbursts of ecstasy and visions. By night, Pauli uh, often went down to the St. Pauli, the notorious red light district of Hamburg. There, the main attractions were not on the main street, the Ripperbahn, but on side streets, such as the Grosse Freiheit, which was Pauli's favorite side street, lined with rough bars and teeming with, uh, and, and with cabarets uh, crawling with women. And there he found the means to alleviate uh, his personal anger and the strains put on his psyche by a life devoted to physics research in which he deemed he was failing. Pauli dropped into an underworld of drugs, prostitution, and alcohol. The more he drank, the more obnoxious he became. Uh, he was often thrown out of a bar, which was a mixed blessing, because sometimes he got into a brawl and was beaten up. He was a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and to make matters worse, he had trouble in, in relations with women uh, with anything uh, besides sex. As he wrote to his good friend Gregor Wenzel, the physicist, in 1926, I have noticed that wine agrees very well with me. After the second bottle of wine or champagne, I usually adopt the manners of a good companion, which I never have in a sober state, <laughs> and then may under these circumstances enormously impress the surroundings, particularly if they are women. Now, in, in the fall of 1927, a, a calamitous event occurred in Pauli's life. His beloved mother committed suicide. His famous father, the chemist Wolfgang Sr., uh, ever the womanized, at this time had gone too far and left his wife for a woman his son's age, and this was too much for her. Ever the great compartmentalizer, Wolfgang Jr., instead of talking about his distress to friends and colleagues, buried himself deeper into his work. Um, luckily, the following year, 1928, the call came from the ETH in Zurich for a professorship, giving Pauli uh, a new lease on life. Some years later, he recalled to Jung how he left Hamburg and traveled towards my new professorship and my big neurosis, as if he didn't have one already. <laughs> what happened was that in 1927, Peter de Bayer decided to leave the ETH and go to Leipzig, uh, the first choice for the job was actually Werner Heisenberg, but Heisenberg decided to stay in Germany, and he was lured anyway by, by, uh, by the buyer. Pauli was the second choice. Despite his brilliant research, uh, there were some questions about his teaching, which has been often described as a soliloquy in which he faced the blackboard 
and his students could see the great man struggling with a fundamental point in physics. So only the very best students got anything out of his courses. The authorities at the ETA figured that he was young enough uh, to change, and so in April 1928, he uh, entered the physics building at number five, Gloria Strasse, and began a, what would be his 30-year career. Uh, socially, he did quite well at Zurich. He um, availed himself of leisure activities. Here he is bathing at the Strandbad, a beach uh, uh, about 10 or 20 minutes drive from, from the city. And he had two good friends that when he first came to uh, Zurich. Uh, they were his uh, assistant, uh, his first assistant, Ralph Kronig, and Paul Scherer, longtime head of the physics department who had a, with whom Pauli had a very complex relationship. And one could imagine that these three pals uh, going swimming during the day and then eating at the Kronenhaller in the evening and then on a warm June night sitting in the Cafe Terrassa and penning a letter to their good friend PQ minus QP Jordan, Pasquale Jordan, as they, as they called him. We're about to study the Zurich nightlife and try to improve it following the new method due to Pauli. By comparison, many greetings, Kronig. The method, however, may also be used to worsen matters. Greetings, Pauli. I, too, have heard so many bad things about you that I would like to meet you, Shera. And Pauli surrounded himself with lots of young physicists besides Kronig, Felix Bloch, I.I. Rabi, R.E. Pyrrhos, and here is uh, Pauli, Rabi, and, Oppen and Stella Postdoc, such as J. Robin Oppenheimer, and the three sailing on Lake Zurich in the summer of 1929. Pauli felt somewhat attracted to Oppenheimer. Uh, perhaps he saw in Oppenheimer a reflection of his own tortured personality. Now, in, in the spirit of his favorite philosopher, Arthur Schopenhauer, uh, Pauli considered marriage to be a bourgeois waste of time. So everybody was amazed that in 1929 he married Katie Deppner, a cabaret dancer whom he had met in one of his many jaunts into the fete demi monde of Berlin. And here's the happy couple walking in the hills around outside of uh, Zurich. Pauli does not have a sardonic smile on his face, and uh, he looks happy in his arm as in, as in Katie's. And suffice it to say, it was a mismatch. It lasted less than a year. Uh, Pauli's scientific creativity never flagged. A month after he was divorced, in December 1930, he audaciously proposed the existence of a new elementary particle, which came to be called the neutrino, in order to save the law of conservation of energy in beta decay. That it was extraordinary that at a time of such great personal stress, uh, Pauli could come up with a suggestion of such cosmic importance. He was truly a great compartmentalizer. He spent the summer of 1931 traveling across the United States speaking on his new particle. Here he is at uh, Caltech looking happy. Uh, uh, meanwhile, his trademark cynical comments were becoming more frequent and gendering further resentment from their targets. Comments such as, why that's not even wrong, so young and so unknown, and you're more interesting drunk than sober. <laughs> and indeed, Pauli was drinking to excess. At the end of the summer, he managed to fall down a flight of stairs during a summer school at Ann Arbor in Michigan and break his arm. Uh, he revealed his true state of mind uh, once more to Wenzel. With women and me, things don't work out at all and probably never will succeed again. This I am afraid I have to live with, but it is not always easy. I am somewhat afraid that in getting older, I will feel increasingly lonely. The eternal soliloquy is so tiresome. Indeed, Pauli had, had resumed his life of uh, drinking and barroom brawling, and eventually the authorities at the Ete Ha uh, heard about the, the, his bitter quarrels with colleagues, placing his... Uh, uh, position in some jeopardy despite his brilliant results in physics. Once again, he was leading two separate lives, and to make matters worse, his, his, his vivid, as he called it, ecstasies and visions were seeping into his, his waking life. In the beginning of, uh, in January 1932, his situation had become critical, and he decided to take his father's advice, despite the fact that he hated him, to consult uh, the celebrated psychologist Carl Jung who, at 57 years of age, was at the height of his fame. Now, unlike uh, uh, Freud, Jung was interested in those aspects of the psyche that could not be attributed to an individual's personal development, 
but to deeper non-personal realms common to humankind, the collective unconscious, whose contents Jung called archetypes. Archetypes are latent potentialities whose origins remain forever unknown because they reside in the shadowy, mysterious world of the collective unconscious, but they can be energized so as to work themselves up and bubble up into consciousness as archetypal images or symbols, and in this way affect our feelings, thoughts, and actions. Um, to his amazement, Jung found that his patients were producing symbols that were akin to symbols in, in esoteric in esoteric sects, esoteric cults, as well as in alchemy, um, branches of knowledge that most people consider that considered as rubbish, but not Jung. And in particular, most important to Jung was the mandala symbol. Jung found that it existed in cultures across the globe and into deep history. The mandala could be a circle, it could be a square, but it was characterized by four objects symmetrically placed. Why four, Jung didn't know early on when he was framing his analytic psychology. He knew that four was a magic number in the sense that, uh, is a mythical number in the sense that there were, for example, four basic elements in Aristotelian science, earth, water, air, and fire, four seasons, four cardinal points of the compass, four rivers of paradise, and so on. And upon achieving stability and inner harmony after deep bouts of deep depression, Jung also found that his patients uh, uh, usually, almost always, produced, produced mandalas. Now, before going to see Jung, uh, Pauli decided, uh, being Pauli, decided to read up on Jung's psychology. And uh, Pauli's books are in La Salle Pauli, if you care to take a look at it. And uh, Pauli focused on Jung's uh, book, 1921 book, Psychological Types, in which Jung set a vocabulary and a framework for his developing analytic psychology. He offered a topology of the mind based on two types, an extrovert and an introvert, with some fine structure in four basic functions taken two at a time, thinking and feeling, and intuition and sensation. Once again, why four, Jung still didn't realize at this time. It just seemed to emerge from his patients. Now, the dominating functions give each individual their own psychology. So uh, people who are, who are thinking sorts devote most of their conscious energy to thinking at the expense of the feeling function, which becomes the inferior function. And in extreme circumstances, the feeling function can drop deep into the unconscious and revert to its earlier archaic state and uh, become incompatible with the dominant function and send up energy surges into consciousness, uh, which can send up energy surges which can produce ecstasies and visions in consciousness and can lead to neuroses. We are all combinations of the two types and of the four basic functions, and our mental health or psychology uh, emerges from a struggle between opposites. The goal of Jungian psychology is to retrieve and develop inferior functions. Now, Pauli strongly identified with many of Jung's insights. And as you can see in his books, uh, uh, Pauli's books, uh, even his physics books, they're amazing. They, they just crack right open. Uh, he just read it once, that was it. Uh, but passages that he considered as important, he would line with, he would mark with three vertical pencil lines. And so consider a passage uh, in which, consider the following passage marked with three lines. Where the persona is intellectual, the soul is quite certainly sentimental. A very feminine woman has a masculine soul, and a very manly man, a feminine soul. This opposition is based upon the fact that a man, for instance, is not in all things wholly masculine, but also has certain feminine traits. Pauli was wondering where his feminine trait, or anima, was. Perhaps Jung could, Jung, Jung could locate it for him. I'd like to point another passage out to you that, uh, once again, uh, marked with three vertical pencil lines, which when Pauli saw it, he probably fell off his chair saying, this is me. His judgment appears cold, obstinate, arbitrary, and inconsiderate. Only with difficulty can he persuade himself to admit that what is clear to him may not be equally clear to everyone. His is an exacting scrupulousness. His work goes slowly and with difficulty. Either he is taciturn or he falls among people who cannot understand him, whereupon he proceeds to gather further proof of the unfathomable stupidity of man. 
Or he may develop into a misanthropic bachelor with a childlike heart. He appears prickly, inaccessible, haughty. He has little influence as a personal teacher, since the mentality of his pupils uh, is strange to him. He is a poor teacher. He has a vague dread of the other sex. Well, with all that under his belt, uh, Pauli went to see Jung in his fortress-like house in Kuznach, and we're just outside of Zurich, and Jung sized them up immediately. What he saw before him was a young man of excellent scientific education, but a very one-sided intellectual, a hard-boiled rationalist who did his best to evade his emotional needs as a waste of time since they had nothing to do with science. Pauli poured out his troubles to Jung. He felt he was at, he was at the end. He, he, he couldn't go on any longer. Uh, he was in a panic, as he put it, over his amazing dreams and visions. He felt he was about to lose his reason. When he entered my house, Jung recalled, I myself felt the wind blowing over from the lunatic asylum. <laughs> after an interval, after Pauli met Jung, uh, he took up face-to-face -face analysis with Jung. Uh, in that interval, he had dreamed 355 dreams and wrote them up. Uh, the analysis lasted from about uh, January 1933 to April 1934. During that time, Pauli dreamt another 45 dreams Jung was ecstatic. They contained the most marvelous series of archetypal images, Jung said in one of the many lectures he gave on Pauli's dreams. Now, Pauli insisted that Jung never use his name. Um, Jung always spoke about the young intellectual, young, brilliant intellectual scientist who was his uh, patient, because Pauli was afraid that his uh, reputation would be ruined. After all, at this time, Jung's reputation in some quarters is rather dodgy owing to his folding in of, uh, of alchemy into his, into his analysis. Of the 400 dreams, Jung lectured on uh, 59 of them because they exemplified uh, what Jung called the process of individuation. It's the centering of the personality between the conscious and the unconscious. So the conscious and the unconscious balance off each other. They're mirror images of each other so that the self can be in between. And this is the highest level of enlightenment in Jung that uh, it, it's signaled by the appearance of symbols such as the anima in men as well as the mandala. Now, Jung's method of analytic psychology uh, concerns his identifying images in his patient's dreams with images from alchemy, myth, and religion, enabling him to seek out archetypes. He conceived of this as a dialectical discussion between in, in individuals consciousness, conscious and unconscious, uh, so that eventually the individual can meet his or her dark side and separate it uh, from, for example, from his, from his, the dreamer's anima. This is Jung's um, uh, analysis room as it, uh, is it possible to lower the lights up front a bit? I guess not. Okay, this is his analysis room, and as it exists today, uh, the patient either sat here with a nice view of uh, Lake Zurich, or over here where the patient could, uh, could see Jung's uh, uh, amazing collection of ancient alchemical texts. Jung sat in the middle on a couch, and the, pi the, chi the table was piled high with papers and books, and so was the floor with research papers and books. It was a highly intellectual uh, analysis room. There was a smaller analysis room next door, which Jung used to write letters and to analyze patients that he wasn't that interested in. But in this room, as Jung put it, uh, during his discussion, he could, he could have an out-of-body experience. He could be on the walls. He could be on the ceiling. He could be everywhere. Let's take a look at uh, Jung's analysis of, of certain of Pauli's dreams. <clears throat> Pauli dreamt that he's surrounded by a group of vague female forms, and he hear a voice within him say, first I must get away from father, and Jung tells him, well, that sentence should be completed by, in order to follow the unconscious, which is those seductive female forms. And Jung shows Pauli um, a, an image from an ancient al alchemical book the, the three maidens are the unconscious, and standing next to them is a figure uh, called, with the ancient Hellenic name of Hermes. Um, Hermes is, uh, is the ancient Hellenic name for the central figure in alchemy, Mercurius. 
which in alchemy is an intermediary between the, between the worlds of lightness and darkness. In Jung's version of alchemy, Mercurius is an intermediator between the conscious and the unconscious. He's called a psychopomp. The father is not Pauli's real father, but it represents the traditional masculine world of intellectualism as opposed to the unconscious, which is, which is feminine. The dreamer feels as if acknowledging the unconscious, he will slight his rationalism. Now, the figures in the Pauli's dreams are feminine, Jung says, is not unusual, because in alchemy, females play the role of trying to seduce the unwary traveler away from his uh, journey, and in Pauli's case, away from seeking his unconscious. But Pauli wants to press on. Uh, the problem is, is how to do this. He dreams that he's rooted in the center of a circle made by a serpent who bites his own tail. This is the way an artist colleague has depicted it. And Jung shows Pauli another page from an ancient alchemical text. This is the serpent who bites his own tail, Euroboros. Euroboros is often the symbol for Mercurius in the early, in the early stages of the alchemical process of purification. The circle symbolizes the circular nature of the transformative process in which the four elements, earth, water, air, and fire, are transformed one into the other. The circle uh, also demarcates off a sacred protected area called the Taminos in alchemy. For Jung, the sacred protected area is the space in which the dreamer can meet his unconscious. Pali dreams of a veiled woman who appears for the first time. Uh, Jung tells her, Jung tells him her technical name is Anima, and that a figure appears and not a symbol means that autonomous activity is brewing in Pauli's unconscious. Something is about to happen. Pauli is about to be able to leave on his journey to meet the unconscious with a lot of terrifying circumstances occurring, including him coming up against irrationality, something which he can't, he can't imagine uh, confronting. Jung shows Pauli a William Blake painting of uh, unknown veiled female figures lining a staircase uh, 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 marking out the ascent of the soul through the seven orbs of the planets back to where it originated in, 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 the, in the sun god. In Jung's psychology, the soul contains all those general human qualities that the conscious attitude lacks, and, and this symbolizes the beginning of Pauli's transformation into a new person. Pauli is fired up, wants to plunge into the sea of the unconscious. His dreams shift to his interactions with three others, one of whom he ignores. This is his anima, which is still deep in his unconscious. It is his feeling function. Jung represents the situation as follows. Pauli is operating only with three basic functions in consciousness. The fourth is mired in the unconscious, deep in the unconscious, and so can lead to energy surges, which can constellate archetypes which can bubble up into consciousness as archetypal uh, images or symbols. And Jung warns Pauli at this point that uh, there will be a, a play with images, and some of these images will be quite terrifying, but stay with it. The end result is a reconciliation between apparent irreconcilables, in this case, the, the conscious and the unconscious. Pauli's dreams shift to uh, 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 topics concerning the numbers three and four. He wonders, Pauli asks Jung, why four? Why the quaternity? The four seems to be something which uh, Jung emphasizes. Three was good enough for Kepler, who was Pauli's intellectual hero, and also for, for Christianity. And could it be that at this point, Pauli is beginning to realize, that, be, recall the angst, the angst in moving from three to four and discovering the exclusion principle? Jung tells him that basic to alchemy is a reconciliation of opposites. Ancient myths tell us that in deep history, there was a shift in the world's consciousness between femininity and masculinity, with the feminine being thrown into the darkness of the unconscious. Pagan and Christian myths and alchemy, as well as Eastern religions, assert that odd numbers are masculine, even feminine. So in Christianity, three is the one, the fourth is feminine. In alchemy, alchemy strives to remove the female element from the darkness thus setting the stage for the alchemical marriage, which is the rec reconciliation against paradigmatic primordial opposites, such as 
water and fire and that basic primordial set of opposites, man and woman. Unity results, Jung emphasizes, from the fusion of fours, not from threes. Can't happen from threes. So, Jung interprets Pali's attempt to achieve individuation through his analysis as analogous to the alchemist striving for the lapis, which is the philosopher's stone, which in Jung's psychology is itself or some total of the conscious and unconscious. This is the goal of individuation. Now, in alchemy, uh, the lapis or the philosopher's stone results in, from a circular transformative process. The four elements, earth, water, air, and fire, continually transform one into the other until finally the fifth element or the, the, the quintessence emerges. This is the philosopher's stone, the highest level of enlightenment in alchemy. Now, in Jung, for Jung, the highest level of enlightenment is, is individuation, signaled by the patient during mandalas. Now, the mandala is the basic, the circle is the basic mandala in alchemy, and Jung must have, at this stage, realized, bang, this is why there are four basic functions. He always drew them in this way as objects symmetrically placed on a circle, and that must be the case, that there can be only four because the, the quaternity is the magic number, the number that allows you to have the deep insight into yourself and to form a mandala. So towards the end of, his, the end of Pauli's uh, analysis is signaled by him drawing mandalas, some of them are skewed mandalas, and finally he comes up with his vision of the world clock. As he wrote, it gave him almost sublime harmony, and it's a complicated, complex mandala as one would expect from a complex person. I can just say a few words about it. It's a fully fledged mandala. It's Pauli's uh, balanced psyche. Jung interpreted the vertical circle as rationality because it's divided into 32 equal segments to which this ticker ticks mechanically through. So it symbolizes rationality or the, the trinity. Jung wrote 32. You can write 32 in lots of different ways. It's four times eight to single out the quaternity. And he had other things to say about 32 as well. We'll leave it at that. Um, now, Pauli's vision is of a three-fold rhythm, the vertical circle, which cuts a horizontal circle divided into four parts, which is the quaternity. Uh, so it's tempered by a quaternity so that each is contained in the other, thus completing the incomplete trinity. Pauli's uh, struggle between three and four have ceased. So, what does this have to do with the exclusion principle? Um, I put this up because in just a few minutes I'll come back to this. In, in, the, in December 1924, Pally wrote uh, uh, to Niels Bohr in Copenhagen a long, long famous letter where he describes his exclusion principle. Um, Heisenberg was with Bohr at the time. They both read the letter and uh, they both had a good laugh about it. Uh, this, is, this is another cockeyed way of explaining how electronic shells fill up. Uh, but a week later, Bohr had second thoughts, and he, there might be something in it. And he, and he signaled that there was something in it to Pauli when he wrote, this is complete insanity, meaning it's good. Now, uh, in 1951, uh, Pauli wrote a letter to his um, uh, one-time assistant and very close colleague, his closest Jungian colleague, Marcus Fiertz to whom, incidentally, Pauli never personally told that he had been uh, analyzed face-to-face -face by Jung. That's how much of a secret Pauli kept it. And in this letter, uh, Pauli emphasized, as he put it, the main thing in discovering the exclusion principle is to go from three to four. Then he continues. Thus, on the psychological line, this time I have once again bumped into the problem of the transition from three to four. In neither case was it by any means Mr. C.G. Jung who suggested it to me, nor was there any deliberate conscious intention. Consequently, I am rather certain that objectively there is an important psychological and perhaps natural philosophical problem connected with these numbers, namely that three and four are archetypes. So Jung's analysis drove home to Pauli why he was having such a difficult time in discovering the exclusion principle. He was not only working not only grappling with the physics problem, but also with his neurosis. He moved from three to four in the physics problem, moved from three to four in curing his neurosis too, namely pulling the fourth uh, basic function or feeling function out 
of the deep unconscious. So in this case, uh, Jung's um, analytic psychology gives some insight into the creative process. Let me continue with some of Pauli's dreams. In his waking life, Pauli was always preoccupied with uh, notions of symmetry, whether it was in physics or in psychology, that is to say, the unconscious and conscious being mirror, mirror images of one another. In 1952, Pauli happened to be working on complex symmetries in quantum physics, and he had a dream. Illustration by an artist colleague. Uh, the, the dream was that uh, Pauli was walking, he dreamt he was walking in the constellation Perseus, and he encountered the double star Algol. In a particular way, he encountered the double star as mirror images of one another. And so this got him thinking that maybe he should look into mirror symmetry in physics, although he, he recalled some years later there was no uh, you know, call for, for doing so. And then he got to think about two other reflective symmetries, charge conjugation, where you replace matter with antimatter, and time reversal, where you change the direction of time. And in 1954, he came out with another one of his great insights, CPT symmetry, or the CPT theorem, in which if you apply CP parity, meaning mirror reflection, and T, time reversal, uh, and charge conjugation, to the equations of physics, you should get the equations of physics back again. Well, okay, big deal. What does this mean? Well, it means that agreement with relativity, which is a sine qua non in physics, and Pauli must have been delighted with this because uh, relativity was his maiden love in, in physics, and the exclusion principle enters too, and that one has to distinguish between collection of particles with integral and half integral spin. Indeed, CPT is of cosmic importance because it says that if you apply CPT, the CPT operation, to our universe, you get another universe which is indistinguishable from ours. In November of that year, of 1954, Pauli had a dream which was so curious it stuck with him for years afterwards. He was in a room walking with a dark woman, his anima, and there were others in the room doing experiments with mirrors. Only the others in the room uh, thought that the reflections were the objects themselves. And this disturbed Pauli and his anima because it, it could turn out that mirror symmetry was not conserved. From time to time, the dark woman turned into a Chinese woman. And uh, Jung's take on this was that, well, the Chinese woman uh, uh, exemplified the, the wholeness of Pauli's anima because in Chinese philosophy, Chinese philosophy strives for wholeness the reconciliation of opposites in the yin and the yang, for example. 1956 was a big year for Pauli. Reiner, in June of that year, uh, Rhinus and Cowens found Pauli's neutrino, which he had hypothesized some 26 years before. And also, in June of that year, Pauli received a preprint from two Chinese-American physicists, Xian Yang and T.D. Lee, in which they suggested that parity might not be conserved um, in all of physics, particularly in the weak interactions, a class of interactions that uh, contains radioactivity, for example. Well, Pauli read the reprint, uh, a preprint carefully because he respected these two people, and uh, chuckled and just put it in his desk drawer. But others took it more seriously. In January of 1957, six months afterwards, uh, uh, C.S. Wu led an experimental team which did the experiment that showed then indeed, mirror symmetry is not preserved in the weak interactions. The New York Times called it the Chinese Revolution. Pauli must have been absolutely amazed at this. After all, just a few years before, he had been walking in his dreams with a Chinese woman, and they were both disturbed about mirror symmetry being violated. And here, a Chinese woman did the key experiment. What a wonderful example of Jungian synchronism, a very meaningful coincidence. Well, Pauli had met uh, Wu in 1941 um, and had, had described that the Jung as being a very beautiful and smart woman. Uh, in, they resumed their friendship, and in uh, January of 1957, Pauli wrote an interesting letter in which he said what really bothered him about the violation of mirror symmetry in physics is that it's violated only in the weak interactions. What does the strength of an interaction, what does the strength of an interaction have to do with the violation of a, of a conservation law? Lots of good questions, no answers, he said. Um, 
T.D. Lee recalled of, to me of that turbulent era that to many physicists, CPT was a fixed point around which all else turned. Pally confessed to uh, Fiertz that the downfall of parity caused him to behave irrationally for quite a while, and Fiertz attributed to his, uh, this, to, to Pally's mirror complex, uh, to which Pally admitted as such. He wrote to Jung about, uh, about his shock at the Chinese Revolution, and in the course of his discussions with Jung, he decided that mirror symmetry was absolutely important to maintain, because only if mirror symmetry were maintained could the conscious and the unconscious be mirror, mirror images of each other, and so only then could the self be, permit, be, be positioned between them, and one could achieve the ultimate form of enlightenment in Jungian psychology, individuation. And Pali concluded that uh, as he had come to suspect, there were psychological reasons for him discovering uh, um, CPT. Namely that mirror symmetry is an archetype. Uh, but archetypes are buried in the collective unconscious. How, how was it constellated uh, in Pali, into Pali's consciousness? And Pali's discussion of this is a wonderful example of uh, Jungian synchronism, uh, Jungian psychology, uh, as well as containing elements that are indigenous to modern theories of creativity. It goes like this. Pauli worked in 1952, was working on problems of symmetry during the day. Um, he got stuck. He would, as all seasoned researchers should do, they stopped work. But they stopped work only consciously. The passionate, intense desire to solve a problem keeps it alive in the unconscious, in which case uh, energy surges could be generated to constellate the archetype of mirror symmetry where it bubbles up into consciousness as the double star algol. So, work on physics during the day energizes archetype. To Pauli, there was a kind of synchronicity because there are unconscious motives when one is involved in something. And so unconscious motives play a role in creative thinking. He believed that the relationship between physics and psychology is that of a mirror image, yet there was no longer any mirror symmetry. But Pauli claims that's no big deal because physicists should have looked deeper into their psyche for a more profound mirror image, of a more profound reflections. And that's CPT symmetry, which is bigger, more grander than mere mirror reflections. Now, while Pauli was struggling with the ramifications of, uh, of loss of, of violation of parity, uh, his old friend uh, Heisenberg passed through Zurich uh, to discuss with Pauli uh, his recent research uh, project, nothing less than a unified field theory of elementary particles that could produce their masses and coupling constants. This was uh, to be the culmination of his, uh, of his research life. Um, it was his passion, and Pauli up to then had been nothing but, but negative. Uh, Heisenberg's approach to physics was a helpful leather, anything goes style, and it had worked in 1925 with his discovery of quantum mechanics, in 1927 with his discovery of the uncertainty principle, in 1932 with his uh, pioneering work on the form of a nuclear force or strong force, and during the 1930s uh, in his attempts to formulate a version of quantum electrodynamics free of infinities. Heisenberg had become entranced with the power of mathematics to understand the physical world. And in this work, he was willing even to introduce an indefinite metric with negative probabilities. This enraged Pauli, who said that, our friendship will stop if you don't stop this nonsense. To which Heisenberg replied, nature exists after all. I mean, Heisenberg was willing to throw rigor to the winds to invent his own mathematics. It didn't matter. For Pauli, rigor had to be maintained at every step in theorizing. And this, incidentally, was uh, why he missed out on several great discoveries. Well, what happened here in this instance is as it had been all through their relationship, Pauli offered Heisenberg a key, a key suggestion. And that was to look for nonlinear versions of the Dirac equation. Heisenberg went back to Göttingen, where his institute was, and uh, came up with, uh, as he put it, the simplest nonlinear extension of the Dirac equation, it's cubic in, in the fields, 
which uh, uh, could maintain uh, the various uh, symmetry, some of the symmetries that Pauli and Heisenberg wanted, such as isotopic spin symmetry. The quantized field psi have very complicated symmetry properties uh, and are rigged up so that they can get rid of uh, certain of the difficulties associated with an indefinite metric. And a combination of these fields with an asymmetric or degenerate vacuum, Heisenberg and Pauli hope, uh, this equation could generate the masses, the K schemes, and coupling constants of all elementary particles, in particular the fine structure constant, 1 over 137, which had always been their holy grail. Indeed, Heisenberg did initial calculations and, and calculated the fine structure constant as 1, as 1 over 250. It should be 1 over 137, so this isn't bad. Pauli was hooked. It seemed as if the old days were back. The two giants of quantum theory once again were working together. They can solve anything. It's bound to turn out magnificently. This is powerful stuff, Pauli wrote to Heisenberg. Heisenberg recalled that never before or afterward have I seen Pauli so excited about, about physics. Indeed, uh, Heisenberg, too, was brimming with excitement because it seemed as if his platonic dream was on the verge of coming true. As he wrote to his sister-in-law, that these relationships that were emerging from, that should emerge from this equation, that these relationships display in all their mathematical abstraction an incredible degree of simplicity is a gift we can only accept humbly. Not even Plato could have believed them to be so beautiful, for these interrelationships cannot have been invented. They have been there since the creation of the world. Heisenberg is wonderfully quotable. The two men wrote up a preprint on which uh, Pauli was scheduled to speak in February 1958 in the United States. Now, for, for Pauli, their research was so fundamental that it had Jungian associations with it. Pauli always spoke about how different he was from Heisenberg, but he thought at this point in time, the two of them were gripped by the same archetype, that of reflection symmetry. And indeed, Pauli felt that every time he sat down on his desk to write equations, his hand was guided by that by the energized, uh, magnificent reflection symmetry of CPT, that is by director reflector. He even dreamt about it, director Spiegler, he even dreamt about it. Uh, Pauli dreamt that he was, once had a dream that he was, he was in a room and two children appeared and he called out to his second wife, Franca, Franca, look, two children. This is Pauli's second wife, Franca, and that's the way Franca recalled Pauli proposed to her, now we married. And the two children to Pauli represented the new results that would emerge from their theory. That there would, his, Pauli's take on why there were two was that it was due to his, uh, his mirror complex. And Pauli saw in their work a realization of the unconscious of what he had sought for years, the physics and psychology of the unconscious as mirror images of one another. Uh, on February 1, 1958, uh, the Pupin Lecture Hall in the Department of Physics at Columbia University was brimming with people. There were 300 people in it. They were packed in the aisles they were sitting. And they had come to hear the great Pauli lecture on a theory that he had formulated with the other great giant of, of quantum physics. Uh, Li, Yang, Wu, Bohr, and Oppenheimer were there. The air was electric, but the, this distinguished audience had nothing but critical comments, but presented in a, uh, uh, a friendly way. Uh, the air was electric, and Pauli got up, began to speak, and uh, a key point in their theory was to explain uh, experimental data on the decay of element, on, on decay schemes, and to predict new decay schemes. Well, Pauli was scribbling on the blackboard, an eminent physicist up that stood up and said, uh, Professor Pauli, that elementary particle does not decay in that way. Pauli stopped in mid-flow. There was a long silence, and then he muttered, well, I must discuss this with my friends in Göttingen, meaning Heisenberg. Uh, then all of a sudden, uh, uh, Yang uh, Ali recalled to me that uh, uh, you could feel the silence. And then others jumped in. It was a free-for-all. Others jumped in to point out loopholes in mathematical proofs. Pauli continued, but his passion was gone. At the end of the, uh, of the lecture, during the question and answer period, 
uh, Bohr and Pauli chased each other around the long table at the front of the room when Bohr was in front. He said, it's not crazy enough. When Pauli was in front, he said, it is crazy enough. After a few revolutions, the audience burst out in applause. Yang said that afterwards, uh, Pauli uh, mentioned to him, as I talk more and more, I believed it. I believed it less and less. The next day, Pauli lecture gave the same lecture at the American Physical Society meeting in New York City, then the biggest of the year at the Hilton Hotel. Uh, the audience uh, this time was made up of brash, young, pragmatic American physicists who were less, who were less courteous. Uh, Lee told me he could not bring himself to attend. Uh, before I go uh, move on, let me just say, uh, Lee gave me this uh, photograph. It's of uh, Lee and Pauli having a conversation in the hallway at Brookhaven during the spring of, uh, of 1958. Now, um, Heis uh, Pauli then went across country and lectured at Caltech, where he encountered Richard Feynman, who I'd had no compunction about calling Bohr an idiot to his face. Pauli began to think, well, maybe it's not, it's not crazy enough. And this illusion, he attacked Heisenberg's calculation of the fine structure constant as 1 over 250. Remember, that's the calculation that had roped him into the whole enterprise. Uh, he wrote to Fierce bitterly, I have never considered it as correct. It's so totally stupid. And in fact, uh, Heisenberg's co-author on this paper, the Italian physicist uh, Ascoli, uh, recalled that when he did the calculation, the fine structure constant came out to be 8. But Heisenberg docked it up to be 1 over 250. Now, later that month, Heisenberg uh, lectured on uh, their joint, his joint work with Pauli and his institute at Göttingen. Of course, the audience, uh, uh, it was a packed audience. Uh, the press was there, and there was a press release that read, most offensively to Pauli, Professor Heisenberg and his assistant, W. Pauli, have discovered the basic equation of the cosmos. And this story was picked up around the world. Um, Pauli first vented his anger to George Gamow, um, and he wrote in a letter in which he uh, put words into Heisenberg's mouth, saying that this is to show the world that I could paint like Titian, only technical details are missing. In fact, Pauli was furious. He wrote to Wu, saying that he had been unfortunately mentioned only in a mild form as a secondary or tertiary auxiliary person of the super Faust, super Einstein, and superman Heisenberg. Heisenberg's desire for simplicity and glory seems to be insatiable. He certainly wishes to compensate earlier failures, perhaps lying in the whole history of his life. And here, alluding, I believe, to Heisenberg's role in the atomic bomb project during the war. Soon after, Pauli withdrew from the collaboration. Heisenberg kept after him, saying that, look, hang on, great results will follow. Pauli wrote to Fierce in May, saying that he believes that if he publishes with me, then it is 1930 again. I have found it embarrassing how he runs after me. In the summer of 1958, uh, the Rochester Conference was held at CERN. This photograph shows uh, Pauli and Heisenberg on a cruise on Lake Geneva sometime during the conference. Pauli was the chairman at a session in which Heisenberg spoke on his fundamental theory. And he introduced Heisenberg as follows. What you will hear today is only a substitute for fundamental ideas. And then he asked the audience, please don't laugh in the wrong places. Ha, ha, ha. By this time, the audience was in fits of laughter. Well, Pauli let Heisenberg finish his paper and then demolished him. Uh, sometime later that, that summer, uh, Heisenberg recalled, he ran into Pauli, and Pauli looked distressed, dispirited. He looked ill like a beaten man. Um, I mean, my take on it is that, of course, Pauli was upset about uh, the physics not working out, but he was more upset was that the, the Jungian connotations that he had given to this theory could never be achieved. T.D. Lee's take on the unified theory was that it contained some interesting uh, points, such as the seeds of spontaneous symmetry breaking, but they reached too far, and that the proper experimental data did not yet exist in 1958 to go, to go after a theory of everything. In other words, in their platonic quest, Heisenberg and Pauli lost their grip on physical reality. On 5 December 1958, while Pauli was teaching his Friday afternoon physics course, he came down with such extreme 
stomach pains that he was rushed to the Red Cross Hospital. The following day, his uh, then assistant, Charles Enns, uh, visited him and uh, saw that Pauli was visibly agitated and asked Pauli, what's wrong? And Pauli said, have you seen the number of this room? And Enns said, no. And Pauli said, it's 137. I'm not getting out of here alive. And he didn't. He was diagnosed with a massive pancreatic carcinoma and died December 15th in room 137, a number over which he had obsessed for many years. His last request had been to speak with Carl Jung. Five days later, uh, Pauli was cremated, and on that day, a uh, memorial ceremony uh, was held at the Frau Munster Church in Zurich. Uh, Franke, his, his wife, uh, set up the ceremony and invited five speakers, Bohr, Vicky Weisskopf, an, an eminent uh, assistant and one-time director here, uh, Fierz, Adolf Gubinbuhl, a, um, an old friend, and Paul Schurer. Um, Carl Jung, at age 82, was relegated to a seat in the rear. One notable absentee was Heisenberg. Now, the Ete Ha had sent Heisenberg uh, an invitation uh, far enough in advance that he could come and pay his respects to his uh, longtime colleague who had sparked his greatest discoveries. Indeed, Heisenberg didn't even write a letter of condolence. He left it to his wife, who simply said it was uh, Christmas season and uh, they were too busy to travel. Might Heisenberg have spurned his old friend because of Pauli's acid criticisms at CERN and elsewhere? Uh, Heisenberg returned to this subject almost two decades later in his autobiography, where he wrote uh, quite heatedly that he found Pauli's uh, criticisms to be quite unreasonable. Indeed, the passion which, which, with which these two men treated, uh, the, the, the um, uh, I should say, the intensity with which these two men treated their passion, physics, went far beyond the grave. Pauli's ashes were interred in the town of Zolokan, where he lived, situated between Zurich, where the Eteha is, and Kuznach, where he used to visit Jung in his fortress-like mansion. In other words, uh, the two places that define uh, the, two, the two aspects of his life, principal aspects of his life, physics and psychology. Jung died three years later. Uh, Franco spent uh, a lot of the remaining 18 years of her life trying to suppress the publication of anything that linked her husband with Carl Jung, feeling that it would diminish um, his scientific reputation. Well, Jung claimed that as a result of his analysis with Pauli, Pauli became a perfectly normal and reasonable man, somewhat calmer and not so critical, who even ceased drinking. Well, calmer, but not with respect to Heisenberg. And with drinking, well, Jung and Pauli drank quite a bit in their evenings together where they discussed literally everything in the universe. And Pauli was always seen at parties glass in hand, he said that uh, alcohol helped him through his, helped him with his bouts of depression. Pauli always noted that he had become a better person after his analysis with Jung. Well, Jung often said that uh, uh, one third of his patients were cured, one third helped, and the other one third was a disaster. Pauli fell somewhere in the middle. Jung's and Pauli's was a truly unique meeting of the mind. And Jung liked to recall that with Pauli, he could enter the no man's land between physics and the psychology of the unconscious, the most fascinating, yet the darkest hunting ground of our times. And what I've given you is, is a linear exposition of a, of a complex story concerning two complex people. For more, I invite you to read my book, uh, Deciphering the Cosmic Number, which there are some copies outside, and you can also order if, if they're out. Thank you very much. Remembering I am feel as a physicist, one would like from these greats of the past, I have never seen Paulin or Heisenberg, to learn something. Uh, that's why although there is this interest, even 
how often they married and, and what they did with women, if one is a man. Now, the question to you would be... Well, let, let me just interrupt before. Uh, that's also important because these were, well, that, these were complicated people. That's why there is electric interest in whether Pauli was feeling well with Jung or Jung with Pauli. I don't find this personally uh -huh. very interesting. Never mind. But my question to you is yeah. more what positive can these stories have okay, for the, the young people who look yeah. to be a Pauli or two Paulis, well, or the, like a, a scientist or something more modest? The positivity of this is that um, uh, complex people live complex lives, and the dynamics behind their lives, um, great, you know, the really great physicists, okay, I and mean, we all try to be great physicists, you know, but just that 1% up there, you know, the Einsteins, the Bohrs, the Paulis, the Heisenbergs, uh, they don't sit all day and scratch out equations, okay? They live an interdisciplinary life. I mean, interdisciplinary is something that's stressed today more than ever, but uh, a lot of people just don't do it. They don't even seem to know how to do it. Uh, but these people read across a wide variety of subjects, philosophy, literature, politics, uh, psychology, um, poetry, and this helped them in their thinking. So that's one thing that you can learn from, from them. Um, but you can also learn, for example, from Powell, he's perhaps not to be as critical as he was. Perhaps he was so critical he just saw out the other side of a, of a, uh, a problem and to be more adventurous, such, such as Heisenberg and et cetera. Well, you could also learn a, a, negative, a, a negative point about Bohr, who was considered, who pe most people considered to be a saint, but really wasn't a very nice guy in, in a lot of ways to a lot of people, especially to, to Pauli. Uh, so, you know, you learn also from uh, reading their original papers, from reading their uh, um, autobiographies, auto autobiographical notes to see how these to see how these people live. I'm not saying you have to emulate their lives, to see how these people live and see the passion which which they address their subjects. Uh, sorry. Um, I wanted just to understand one thing you said. I mean you said that um, essentially uh, Pauli was undergoing analysis from nineteen thirty three to 1934 yes. at Jung, and that he dreamt something like 320 dreams. Yeah, 325, like, yeah. Okay. And then 50 more dreams and 45, overall, there were more besides, yeah, right, so, yeah. Um, uh, what strikes me, and this is the first question, then I have another yeah. one, is that he was dreaming in a row for one year. Yeah. You know, just uh, probably every evening, is that true? I mean, That's right, yeah, he dreamt, yeah, he was, an, he was an assiduous dreamer. Uh, no, sometimes no, people, no. sometimes okay. people did worry about him. And in fact, Franca, Franca when he died, Franca when he died committed a real literary crime and that uh, she ripped up, uh, she destroyed what, uh, what, uh, what, uh, whatever dream she could find of his, but she was not interested in him. When he would discuss his dreams with her in the morning, she would just say, I don't want to hear it. Um, but he, uh, wrote up these dreams. Um, they're right now, unfortunately, one can't see them. Well, Jung, the way I describe Pauli's dreams, let me say uh, that is the way Jung, this is the way that Jung describes the, uh, uh, the analysis. Jung didn't keep minutes of, of, of his analysis. He recalled them, and uh, in his, in his uh, uh, long, long paper, uh, Psychology and Alchemy, he describes Pauli's dreams. And there are other, without mentioning his names, there are other unpublished sets of lectures he gave where he almost gave it away, but not quite. People like Fierce uh, uh, strongly suspected that it was, it was Pauli who was the um, analysis. But Pauli was an assiduous dreamer, and as soon as he could in the morning, wrote him up. Uh, of course, there's this quantum, quantum mechanical effect of the observer, you know, that you do uh, change a little bit, but he tried to get the coloration just straight, just right, and drew pictures too, which unfortunately, uh, they're closed to the public now. Only, only one person uh, is looking at them and is putting them together, and apparently they, they will be out uh, uh, next year. Another person, and incidentally, while uh, talking about dreams, Federico Fellini, it turned out, had been analyzed, also analyzed by Jung, and his dreams with his drawings just came out. So be interested to compare 
the two. I mean, the two are highly, highly creative. And, 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 and at that great creative moment, boundaries dissolve, I believe, between all disciplines. And so it'd be interesting to see what Fellini has to say as well. Did I answer your first question? Uh, sorry, uh, the other question was just a very stupid one. I, you mentioned uh, a co-authorized paper by uh, Heisenberg and Ascoli, probably, you wanted to say, yes. as an Italian physicist. Uh, I didn't know that there was a, a co-authorized paper of those Yes, two. oh yeah, 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 he, uh, yeah he, it does exist. You look in, um, it was published, but I, I, saw it, I saw the version in Heisenberg's collected works. I see. Yeah, in one of Heisenberg's later collected works. It, it's, in, it's interesting reading, actually. Sorry, I'm not sure if this is the same question, but so y there was a paper by uh, Pauli and Heisenberg, which is, I'm, as far as I'm able to tell, was never published. Yes, it wasn't, uh, as far as I know. How do I wasn't. find it? Uh, in Heisenberg's collected works, the same volume as the uh, Ascoli uh, uh, paper. It, it's, uh, it's a little bit disturbing to hear that uh, a great hero of physics like Pauli believed in nonsense like Jungian psychology. And can I, can that's I, rather, can that's I rather dismissive. An, can I propose an alternative uh, theory? Huh? You know, can I propose an alternative theory? Sure. This is, a, this is an irascible man who has very few friends, and there's another man who has a professional desire to spend a lot of time with him. And so Polly says, I can put up with this nonsense if I get to talk to somebody for a few hours a day. No, it wasn't like that at all. Uh, they had uh, the face-to-face, -face, I mean, it, it's something, it's where a, it began as a, their relationship began as a, a doctor-patient relationship, then uh, grew into a colleagueship and blossomed into a, a friendship. Uh, Pally had lots of friends, that isn't quite true. That uh, He was selective and is hardly selective, more selective than, than people generally are. Um, he, he didn't like small talk and, and uh, in dinners, he um, you know was highly selective on who he had dinner with too. But he had lots of uh, people to to talk to. There was no problem there. And he was uh, um, when he was a student, he became int very interested in Kepler uh, through his uh, teacher Sommerfeld. Um, Kepler, the harmony of the spheres, and um, emphasis on on whole numbers, on uh, integers, and read into Kepler. Um, and was uh, amazed at when he read Kepler's, particularly Kepler's book where Kepler's third law is in it, he was amazed at how Kepler worked in that uh, uh, Kepler would uh, essentially tell you what he was doing that day, whether he had an argument with his wife, and, uh, uh, and then he would do a little physics and then go back to uh, discussions of alchemy and so on. And in that, um, in that book, um, Kepler has a long, diatribe with Robert Flood, who was a Rosicrucian. And you can see Kepler discussing deep points in alchemy, which was not nonsense at, uh, uh, I don't think it's nonsense today, but certainly, for example, Newton was uh, an avid believer in alchemy. I mean, Newton, um, as John Maynard Keynes, the economist who bought all, the, all of Newton's papers in 1934, that's how we know something about Newton. When Newton wrote to Robert Hooke, uh, yeah, Robert Hooke wrote to Newton saying, what are you doing these days? And Newton said, I do physics in my spare time, which was quite, quite the case. What interested Newton was alchemy, how big the city, the new city of Jerusalem should be to receive souls on Judgment Day, and so on. Uh, Newton it was not the first modern physicist. He's been aptly described as, as the last magician. Um, alchemy, so alchemy was something that was considered seriously at one point. True, it dropped out for a long time, but um, I can't give you a course in history of science here, but uh, in, German, in Germany, in Central Europe, um, very mystical forms of knowledge were going around called uh, Naturphilosophie. Um, and people, that's the way the, the first law of thermodynamics was discovered, as a matter of fact. And people, even with Helmholtz, you look at Hermann von Helmholtz's early papers, there's a little bit of, of mysticism and alchemy and that, and then finally Helmholtz declared that this stops, and you know, we write scientific papers uh, the way the public should view us. You know, This is the problem, this is, we, we solve it, then you make a prediction. So all that stuff was pushed out. But you look at these people's letters, and, and they were you know, more mystical than, than you would think. So I, I disagree with you that Jungian psychology is nonsense. It's still practiced today. 
You also certainly read the, the book by Charles Ensor. Pardon me? The book by Charles Yes, I read that, yeah. yeah. Is Charles Ensor here? You can, no, he's not here. Oh, oh, I've seen that's him. Too bad. Okay. Uh, you can read in that book that, that Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Pauli hasn't given out the, his, his dreams because she, she thought they were, they were edited. Paul, uh, Pauli had edited his dreams to please Mr. Jung. No, oh, I, I, don't, I don't know anything about that. It's written in that sure. book. You can yeah, read. Uh, well, that, you know, what, things that are written in books uh, are not always true. <laughs> I don't see how we could do that anyway. But. Well, I remember a, a colloquium talk in the Harvard in the in the Havel in uh, 19 in December 1956. Uh, and where? In, I'm sorry. In Havel in the UK. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, Rutherford Laboratory. Yeah. And uh, speaker was Abdul Salam. Chairman was Pauli. And Abdul Salam was talking about his two neutrino theory, which yeah. was violating parity. And at that time, just the first rumors became known of the CSU's experiment. Yes. So in the end, well, during the colloquium, Pauli had two basic oscillations during the colloquium, either like that or like that. <laughs> if he went like that, yeah. speakers got very nervous, but he went like that. Yeah. So in the end, he got up and he apologized publicly that he had discouraged Abdul Salam to publish his two component theory uh, because he said parity could not be violated yeah. since Kant had already said uh -huh. it's against a priori uh, uh, yeah. uh, 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 ideas. So I think one question is that one should not believe too much in authorities, even if, if they are so oh, famous yeah. as Pauli. Yes. Right. Nature is more imaginative even than the philosophers. Mm. Yes. I agree. Who was Professor Tice later, and uh, he suffered, as far as I can know, psychologically for all his life. <laughs> 